Welcome back everyone, Dr. Faust here once again with another Hero Forge painting tutorial. And this time we're going to talk about object source lighting. Now let me start off by saying that I'm not a huge fan of object source lighting myself, so I don't employ the technique a whole lot. I know how it's achieved, I just don't practice it. So this is going to be a learning experience for both of us. So what we have today is a little sneak thief. Little guy, I made the scenario for him. He's trapped in an alleyway, you got guards coming at him, but he's got a cheeky grin and he knows he's gonna get away. So that's the idea that I'm using as I go forward with the paint job on this figure. To begin with, we are starting with our little thief's cloak. And this is painted with a standard overhead lighting scheme. And the technique we're using to highlight is stippling. Basically, it is very light jabs stabbing at the miniature. Now, if you remember our Orc Bard, our previous video, uh, I built him up as a very fancy bard, very rich, uh, had really fine clothes. Well, this guy's a little, little scrapper. He lives in the streets, so we want him to look a little bit dirtier. Uh, so this technique gives a little bit more uh, texture to the cloak, makes it look like it's a uh, something of a rougher, more coarse fabric. With the cloak done, now we can focus on the front of the miniature, and this is where the object source lighting technique begins. Uh, we're not actually adding that yet, but we have to prep the miniature for it. As I said, my scenario for this figure was that he's cornered in an alley, there's some guards after him carrying torches, and that is where the light is going to be coming from. So. Uh, we're going to have a very warm light coming from in front, a little bit above eye level because he's a short guy. So it's not going to be too far off of a standard overhead lighting scheme, uh, but it's definitely going to be much more horizontal than a straight vertical scheme. Our angled lighting not only determines what direction the shades and the highlights fall, it also limits the colors that we can use here. That's why I'm going for a very neutral gray color for his shirt. Uh, we're going to have a warm yellow color for the light, so we obviously don't want to use a lot of reds or a lot of yellows on this figure. As we apply the highlights to the shirt, you can see we are being much more limited as to their location of the application uh, because we just want those highlights on the front. The back is all in shadow, uh, so normally we'd be applying these first couple highlights uh, up and down both sides of the sleeves with an overhead lighting scheme. However, we're not doing that in this case. For the skin, I wanted to stick with something of a lighter tone so it reflects the light better. So our main two colors, base colors, are going to be cork brown and beige red. I guess now will be a good time to mention one of the problems I have with object source lighting is uh, if you do it properly, you actually lose contrast on the figure. And of course, we always want to paint contrast so we can see the details. The spaces between the fingers here uh, with an overhead lighting standard overhead lighting uh, scheme, there will be a lot of contrast, a dark area between those fingers so they stand out. However, since those fingers are facing forward in this case, towards the light, there should be much, much less shadow between the fingers. But if we do that, well then it's just going to look like a lump rather than individual fingers. So we kind of have to 
employ both techniques at one time, we have to overshadow in the fingers even though they wouldn't be if the light is coming from the front. So there are little tweaks like that where you just have to say, I must do it this way because it will look better or it will look wrong if I don't do it, even though we are trying to achieve light from a certain direction. So here is a fun and simple technique for painting leathers. This is unrelated to object source lighting, but base coated with a mix of flat earth and camo black brown. And now I am applying straight flat earth and we're doing this in a stippling method, kind of like we did with the cloak. Next, we give it a fairly heavy wash, a mix of black and brown ink. When that is dry, we go back once again with the flat earth and once again apply it in a stippling method. And after that's dry, once again, apply black and brown ink wash. What this does, it gives us a lot of nice variation in tone to the leather. It makes it look like real weather that's worn and oiled, maybe a little wet. Uh, and you can do this multiple times. I did it, I think three times total here. Uh, on a larger surface you can do it much more. Uh, and just all those transparent layers going over uh, different amounts over different amounts of flat earth gives you a really nice leather tone, especially on a much larger object. Uh, and then once we're done here, we do a little final highlight for a little uh, edge rubbing on the very edge of the boots with some game color leather brown. If you remember from our Orca Bard video, I was talking about the importance of color balance. Uh, basically, if you have a little bit of red on the top of the figure, you want a little red on the bottom so it visually balances. And notice we're not doing that here. Uh, that's because this guy, he's a little street urchin. He doesn't have a lot of coin, uh, so he's not wearing bright colors and he doesn't have time to match his clothes. So using mismatching colors actually benefits the story that we're trying to tell with this figure. Also, we're sticking with more muted colors, uh, a lot of browns and grays on this figure because uh, we don't want to have bright colors because that's associated, in a fantasy setting at least, with more uh, of a rich society, uh, bright reds and purples and blues. So uh, using these colors on this figure sets them more you know, in the lower class. For the hair, we are going to go with red to give him a little bit of a well, little little orphan any look. Can't go too red once again because of the yellow we're going to add with the object source lighting. Uh, so we're going to go for a bit more of a chestnut color.
And finally, we get to the part that this whole video has been building up to, the actual object source lighting. We're going to do this in two colors. Our first color is going to be Scrofulous Brown, and we are applying this with glazes. Remember, a glaze is an extremely thin layer of paint. It's basically tinted water, and we are applying it in keeping in mind the direction that we want our torch uh, our theoretical torch is coming from. So it's coming from above and to the front. And it's going over all the areas that we highlighted and blending a little bit in to where the base coat is. Things we have to keep in mind here is that the lighter highlight color is going to pick up the color more. So we have to pay attention to that. We also have to figure out exactly what the object source light, the yellow, let's, I'm going to call it the torch light so I don't get confused. The torch light is uh, hitting, so it's constantly looking at the figure from that upper uh, front direction and see what the torch can see and what that color is going to be landing on. So we have to keep in mind things like the sword here, it's going to block some of the light towards the pants, so we don't want to do too much on the pants. After about four layers of our Scruffiest Brown, I'm adding, ironically, Sun Yellow now. Just to add a little bit of extra highlight on the areas that are going to be really close to the torch. So on the sword there, uh, the fingers, uh, the, that one arm that's extending out, and the face. The OSL continues on the base as well, and I think this actually uh, really adds to the figure much more than the OSL on the figure itself, uh, because uh, it's very obvious where the light's coming from as we're highlighting just the front area of all those little cobblestones, and then it fades out towards a darker color uh, in the back. And also, this is a, a bit more of a difficult way of doing object source lighting because we don't have the actual object uh, on the figure itself. The light we're using is coming from uh, uh, off camera, essentially. Uh, it would be a m bit easier to visualize if we, he was holding a lantern or something like that. So I am doing this a bit, a bit uh, more of a difficult way. <laughs> With our lighting in place, now I can go back and add a little bit of extra shadow where needed. Uh, add a little bit more to the uh, cloak, the back of the sleeves, and also underneath the figure. I really need to establish what direction exactly the light was coming from before I decided how to add uh, the shadow from that light. And that's it. Here we have our little OSL thief. It's a fairly simple technique. As you can see, all we did was add a few glazes, a couple different yellow colors, and it was pretty much done. The only trick is applying the highlights in the proper direction towards your new light source. And if you're already applying overhead highlights uh, towards a, a direction of the sun above the figure, it's just a matter of thinking about it a different way, essentially turning the figure or turning the sun and applying the highlights in that direction. So if you can do an overhead lighting scheme, you can probably do an OSL scheme as well. Now, the reasons I really don't use a lot of OSL because it's, it's a little bit of a, a tricky thing. It's best used when you can control the light. Uh, it works best in a shadow box or something like that, where you control the direction the light's coming from. Uh, I try to paint for practical reasons, and that's what I'm teaching you. So. Uh, if you take an OSL miniature and you put it on the battlefield or you put it in a cabinet, it's going to be lit by overhead light, not by an object. Uh, so your painted light is going to be conflicting with the real light in the room. The worst possible way you can view OSL is in a bright room on a spinning turntable like I'm showing you here. Uh, but I want to be honest, I want to show you the, the benefits and the negatives to it. 
Uh, it's much more well viewed in the dark, essentially, where you can control the lighting. Uh, that's why a lot of OSL looks really good on the internet, but if you see it in person, it doesn't always work as well uh, because you're seeing it in reality and not uh, a flat image on a screen with very well controlled light. Even though I'm not a fan of OSL, um, I'm still kind of pleased that I was badgered into doing a video about it uh, because it did remind me of the importance of overhead lighting, how to view all the folds on a miniature and get light coming uh, from the proper direction. It just, this time it was from uh, a different direction than what I'm used to. So it was kind of shook up the norm. And as I always say, trying new things is the way you improve your painting. So. Uh, again, this really reminded me of the importance of getting your highlights and your shades all coming from the proper direction. So that's it for today. Hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you again soon. Thanks for watching.